Noswithal Paub, Mein Bless i Croesu Ki Ir de Gwethiad Hun Achran Canovan, Lenod Rothiad Cumri, Privascol Cartith. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Cardiff University's Wales Governance Centre, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this event. Uh, it's a particular pleasure to welcome Joanna Cherry MP to give our Wales Governance Centre annual lecture this year. Um, Joanna is MP for Edinburgh Southwest. Um, she was elected first in 2015. Uh, prior to becoming an MP, uh, she had a distinguished legal career in Scotland as an advocate. Uh, she had done considerable work for the Scottish government, first as a junior counsel, then as an advocate deputy and senior advocate deputy. In 2009, she was appointed Queen's Counsel. Uh, she set up the Lawyers for Yes group, which campaigned for independence in the 2014 Scottish independence referendum. Um, and following that, in February 2015, she was adopted as the candidate for the Westminster parliamentary seat, which she now holds. She's the shadow SNP spokesperson for Home Affairs and Justice. And uh, at a time when there's a certain amount of uh, um, political commentary about um, the way in which some lawyers' skills don't necessarily translate into political debate, I think she's made a particular uh, virtue of bringing together her skills as a lawyer and her skills as a politician. Uh, most famously, she um, uh, challenged the five week prorogation of parliament by Boris Johnson uh, through the Scottish courts. Her case, Cherry versus Advocate General for Scotland, um, ended up then together with a case brought in England in the Supreme Court and resulted in the quashing of that prorogation. Um, and at a time now when uh, the UK government's internal market bill, which has been particularly controversial for its um, for its uh, threats to violate inter international law, to break international law, it also has very substantial implications for devolution. Um, and uh, we're now at a moment where the House of Lords has essentially filleted the bill of its devolution elements, as well as challenging the Irish Protocol, uh, Northern Irish Protocol elements. I think Joanna's skills when that bill comes back to the Commons will be put on particular display. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, aside from reminding people that if you want to tweet about this event, you can do so using the hashtag CherryWGC. I'd like now to hand over to Joanna for her lecture. Diochenvar. Noswithar. And thank you, Dan, for that very uh, generous introduction. And, and thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. My pleasure at being asked to give this lecture has been tempered slightly by not getting the added bonus of a visit to Cardiff. But I hope that's something that can be addressed when the pandemic is over, or at least under control. And it's great to be speaking at the end of a week where finally there's light at the end of the tunnel, thanks to the vaccines. My last trip um, to Wales, and I stress that I'm standing in Edinburgh just now, my last trip to Wales was to give the fraternal address at the Plaid Cymru Spring Conference in 2018, and I greatly enjoyed it and the warmth and hospitality of my welcome. My only regret was that I was shamed by Liz Savile Roberts announcing to the whole conference that on the road trip up from London, I and her other Scottish passenger had marred her usual healthy living lifestyle by introducing her to the delights of Greg's pasties at one of the service station stops. Anyway, it's a great honour to be asked to give this speech. Um, since my election as an MP in 2015, I've benefited greatly from the work of the centre and it's been my pleasure to share platforms and select committee evidence sessions with Professors Richard Wynne-Jones, Laura McAllister and Joe Hunt. And it's been my particular pleasure to renew my acquaintance with Professor Daniel Wincott, whom I first met a long time ago when we were teenagers and he was dating my best friend. Now, 
Although Wales voted to leave and Scotland voted to remain, a commonality of interest in defending our economies and our devolved settlements has brought us closer together since the Brexit referendum. But it's also accelerated the pressure for constitutional change in both our nations. And as the United Kingdom stands on the verge of leaving the customs union and the single market, we're still unclear about the nature of the future relationship with the European Union. The Trump era has come to an end in America and Biden will be a very different president. What happens to the Northern Irish Protocol and the Good Friday Agreement could well determine whether or not Biden's administration will entertain a trade deal with the United Kingdom. And many Democrats take the view that the United Kingdom government is the last outpost of the Trump project. Seen from Scotland, it certainly feels that way. The post-Brexit landscape has accentuated our sense of political alienation from the concerns and the projects of Westminster. And so, Scotland most certainly does not stand where she did. She is not so much at a crossroads as on a highway to independence. A couple of exits have been missed, but the indicator is now on, and I'm confident that Scotland will take the next exit. The destination is not separatism, nor secession, but a resumption of the statehood which was relinquished in 1707. So why have things changed so much? On the 18th of September 2014, 55% of those who voted in the independence referendum voted to remain part of the United Kingdom. During the last days of the referendum, the Better Together campaign suffered an almighty panic, during which even Her Majesty the Queen was pressed into service to defend the Union. Ten days before the vote, a sensational YouGov poll put support for independence at 52%. It was the first time independence had been in the lead and it caused some consternation. Two days before the referendum, the leaders of the three main United Kingdom political parties, David Cameron, Ed Miliband and Nick Clegg, personally pledged that a no vote would result in the delivery, the swift delivery, of extensive new powers for the Scottish Parliament. Their pledge appeared as a vow on the front page of Scotland's best-selling daily tabloid. This is solemn, it said. You can trust us. It's an amusing footnote to this episode that four years later, the former editor who planned that famous front page announced his support for independence and is now the chief press officer for the Scottish National Party at Holyrood. But back in 2014, he played an important role in ensuring a vote for the status quo on the understanding that there would be significantly more powers for Hollywood. But now, just over six years later, the very foundation of the devolved settlement between London and Edinburgh is under threat from the Internal Market Bill. And 14 consecutive opinion polls have put support for independence at 52% or over. One poll, which showed support at 58%, highlighted majority support amongst both men and women people in all social class groups and every age group under the age of 65. Even the staunchly unionist Times newspaper has recognised in a recent editorial that these successive polls have shown a majority of Scots in favour of an early referendum and that they cannot be ignored. So Scotland most certainly does not stand where she stood in 2014. So what accounts for this increase in the support uh, for independence? Well, the well-respected pollster Sir John Curtis has concluded that the UK government's pursuit of Brexit has undermined Scottish confidence in the Union and led to increased support for independence. His analysis shows that prior to the coronavirus, the growth and support for independence occurred among those who were pro the European Union. And he's also found that voters in Scotland are now largely pessimistic about the consequences of Brexit, but relatively optimistic about what independence would bring, and, and that's a big difference. According to Professor Curtis, as at 31st January, Brexit Day, support for independence in Scotland had edged up to about 50%. But the further rise in support since then has been as strong among Leave supporters as it has been amongst Remain supporters. And it's come about as, resu as a result of public confidence in the Scottish Government's handling of the coronavirus crisis. The polls have shown that the Scottish public think the Edinburgh Government 
and Nicola Sturgeon in particular, have handled the pandemic well. They take the opposite view in relation to the UK government and Boris Johnson's handling of the pandemic. Another very well-respected pollster, Mark Diffley, broadly agrees with Professor Curtis's analysis. And he says that while Brexit provided the initial impetus for the growth in support for independence, he goes on to say, and I, I quote, the pandemic has given voters a daily reminder that the Scottish government has the power to make decisions about the most important issues of the day, decisions that can diverge from the rest of the United Kingdom government. And that appears to have resonated with many voters, both in their views of the pandemic handling and for some, their views on independence. So those are the views of the pollsters. Here are my thoughts. In a major speech to the Middle Temple earlier this month, Sir John Major said that the core change in the new Britain which is currently being forged is Brexit, albeit for a time it's been hidden behind the Covid crisis. And I agree with Sir John Major's analysis in that respect. The United Kingdom that voters in the independence referendum of 2014 voted to remain part of no longer exists. The socialist, federalist UK promised to Scots by the unionist left seems even further away than it did six years ago. And Labour have been all but wiped out in Scotland as a meaningful political force. At last year's general election, the Labour Party suffered their worst defeat uh, in, uh, in the UK as a whole for, for decades. And it's hard to see how even a, successfully star, a successful Starmer-led Labour Party can gain back the ground it lost in just one election. And that's not just my view, it's the view of many friends in the Labour Party. So after 10 years of what were hamstrung minority Tory governments, we're now looking at 10 years of majority government from a Tory party which has espoused such an extreme position that it no longer has room for the likes of Ken Clark or Dominic Grieve. That Boris Johnson would be resident in number 10 seemed even more unlikely than Brexit during the 2014 independence referendum. And those of us who predicted these possibilities were scoffed at. Now, the victory of Boris Johnson and his huge majority were made in England, in English constituencies. In Scotland, the Scottish National Party rides high in the polls and we keep winning elections rather emphatically. Whilst one should never take anything for granted in politics, we look set to do so again next year. And if we do next year, we'll win that election on a clear mandate to hold a second independence referendum. In Scotland, there is significant unfinished business from the first independence referendum. That cross-party pledge to create a different form of devolution made in those last desperate days of the campaign has never been delivered. For all the promises of federalism or Devo Max, the advent of a UK government committed to delivering either is very far away. The present UK government are instead dedicated to undermining the devolved settlement rather than strengthening and improving it. And what Boris Johnson said about devolution being a disaster and Tony Blair's biggest mistake was really simply the verbal acknowledgement of the hostility shown towards the devolved settlements in the internal market bill. And my colleagues in the Scottish government have looked on in, in recent years uh, since the Brexit referendum looked at with envy, while the concerns of the Irish government are placed centre stage in Brussels, but Scotland is ignored or derided at Westminster. And I think it's very instructive just to review the course of events since Scotland voted no in September 2014. This is just a potted history, I can't possibly cover everything. But in May 2015, it's now history that Scotland elected 56 Scottish National Party MPs out of a po total possible, uh, possible uh, total of 59. Yet when that vow of more powers for the Scottish Parliament came to be enacted in the Scotland Bill, not one single amendment proposed by those Scottish National Party MPs was accepted to the Bill. Then came the Brexit vote in June 2016. While it was won by a small margin across the United Kingdom as a whole, Scotland voted by 62% to remain and Northern Ireland by 
Yet, in drawing up her negotiating red lines, Theresa May gave no consideration to the fact that two out of the four constituent nations of the United Kingdom had voted to remain. There was no coalition building, no reaching out, no acknowledgement of what had happened in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And in fact, in December 2016, when uh, the Scottish Government produced a, a policy paper, Scotland's Place in Europe, putting forward the idea of a differentiated deal for Scotland or a compromise for the whole of the UK, whilst it was well received, favourably received by Michel Barnier, it was completely ignored by the UK government, who went on to cut the Scottish government out of the Brexit negotiations completely. And to take just one small example, the Scottish government has been completely excluded from participating in negotiations regarding the future trade relationship, despite massive implications for our expanding food and drink industry and for the fishing industry. As is well known, the Scottish Parliament voted with the cross-party support of everyone, apart from the Conservatives and one Liberal Democrat, to withhold consent to the European Union withdrawal bill, but that too was ignored. And the Sewell Convention, which provides that Westminster will not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, has been repeatedly ignored throughout the Brexit process. And thanks to the decision of the United Kingdom Supreme Court in the first Miller case, we now know that the Convention has no legal force to protect the devolved settlement, despite its entrenchment in uh, the Scotland Act of 2016. Then, when the Scottish Parliament passed its own legal continuity bill to deal with the consequences of Brexit for devolved powers, it was challenged by the British government in the UK Supreme Court. And while the hearing of the case was pending, the Tories retrospectively changed the law in the House of Lords by amending the withdrawal bill to render large parts of the continuity bill ultra vires. When those amendments came back from the Lords to the Commons, Scottish MPs got 19 minutes in which to consider them, and the whole of the 19 minutes was taken up by the Conservative government minister. And it's important to remember that that was what prompted the SNP's famous walkout of the Commons during Prime Minister's questions in June 2018. Matters moved on, and of course the withdrawal from the European Union proceeded in January of this year after Boris Johnson's election victory. But so far as Scotland was concerned, once more we elected a majority of Scottish National Party MPs, this time 48 out of 59. But EU withdrawal went ahead, despite the opposition of those SNP MPs, and indeed despite the opposition of all but six of Scotland's 59 MPs. And now we face the undermining of the devolved settlement in the Internal Market Bill, which uh, Professor Wincott spoke about in, in his introduction. And as he said, it uh, has been filleted in the Lords, but those amendments have yet to come back to the Commons. And I don't see the Conservatives tolerating that filleting, uh, and I see a Conservative majority as likely overcoming it in the Commons. But as Daniel said, as well as breaking international law, the powers which the UK government seek to give themselves in that bill constitute an unprecedented threat to the powers of the Scottish Parliament. It runs a coach and horses through the devolution settlement which Scots voted for by an overwhelming majority in 1997. In October of this year, we marked the 20th anniversary of the death of Donald Dewar. He was Scotland's first FM under devolution and the architect of the scheme of devolution set out in the Scotland Act of 1998. If not specifically reserved, then a power is devolved in terms of that act. But the Internal Market Bill introduces a new principle into the devolution settlement by providing broad cross-cutting powers to allow UK ministers to enforce internal market provisions across devolved areas. Clause 50 reserves state aid to Westminster after a dispute as to whether it was reserved or devolved. And Clause 48 gives UK ministers wide powers to spend in devolved fields challenging the previous assumption that they would spend only in reserved fields and that with a few exceptions financial transfers to the devolved administrations would go through the block allocation governed by the Barnett formula. For that analysis I'm indebted to Professor Michael Keating 
and he gave evidence to the Scottish Affairs Select Committee last week. Uh, and he, he said this of the Internal Market Bill uh, devolved provisions. When we were in the European Union, the Scottish Parliament was subject to the very general provision that it must legislate within European law. That was a broad transversal principle that applied to everything. The Internal Market Bill attempts to introduce that principle into UK law, but without all the safeguards that exist in the European arrangement. Yes, in the EU, there is a broad provision that cuts across all kinds of fields, but it's subject to proportionality, subsidiarity, a community method of making policy, qualified majority voting, and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. None of that is present here. This, to my mind, represents a major constitutional change." End quote. And so there we have the uh, estimation of a, not a politician, but a, an expert witness. Now, my colleague in the Scottish Government, Mike Russell, has described the Internal Market Bill as a very subtle power grab, but a power grab it is. Holyrood is not getting any new powers, but Westminster is getting sole control over state aid. And in order to enforce the internal market, United Kingdom ministers are getting an explicit power to cut across decision making by the Scottish Parliament in a whole range of devolved areas, from education to building regulations. And I think what we are seeing here is a rebalancing of the constitutional settlement so far as devolution is concerned. The clear delineation of Donald Dewar's great scheme will go. And that's a very significant change. Some would say an undermining of the devolved settlement, which 75% of people in Scotland voted for across party lines in 1997. But it certainly flies in the face of the promise of greater powers, which was made at the end of the referendum campaign and on which people like Michael Gove doubled down during the Brexit referendum campaign. It really matters not to the British constitution at this stage that on 7th October, all parties in the Scottish, Scottish Parliament, apart from the Conservatives, voted to withhold legislative consent to the Internal Market Bill. We know that the Sewell Convention isn't worth the paper it was written on. And so, looking to these events, the history of what's happened since Brexit and the Internal Market Bill, I think the Brexit process has told Scottish voters a lot about the reality of devolution. It's confirmed, if it were ever in doubt, that power devolved, is power retained, and that the United Kingdom is not the union of equals we were told about during the 2014 referendum, but a unitary state in which devolved power can be taken back to Westminster by executive fiat when it suits the executive to do that. And we also know in Scotland that contrary to what we were told in 2014, Scotland does not lead the United Kingdom but must rather follow England where England wishes to go, whether we like it or not. Now, at a, con a conference in London a couple of years ago, I asked the former Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland, John Bruton, what he thought of Scotland's treatment during the Brexit process. And he said that he felt Scotland was marginalised within the UK and that that sort of marginalisation would not happen in the European Union. And that if the European Union was taking a decision as drastic as Brexit, and it had only four nations in it, all four nations would need to agree. But in the United Kingdom, it doesn't matter what Scotland says. It doesn't matter what Northern Ireland says. They can always be overridden by the English vote. That's not an anti-English comment. It's a comment on the constitution of the United Kingdom. If Scotland was a member if, if Scotland were a member state of the European Union, even though we are a country of only 5.5 million people, we would have the same veto as Ireland has over a major decision such as Brexit, as it, and in the same way as the bigger countries have. And when looked at that way, the European Union seems rather a more attractive future for Scotland than the United Kingdom. Now, it's true, of course, and, and I don't need to tell a Welsh audience this, it's true, of course, that the cavalier attitude of the UK government towards devolution has been experienced not just in Scotland and Northern Ireland, but also in Wales. And for a long time in Northern Ireland, the voice of the pro-European Union majority was really without expression at Westminster, 
and Stormont, while well, Stormont wasn't sitting. And the attitude of the Tories was very much uh, one of ignorance or insouciance towards the Good Friday Agreement. In the meantime, the Scottish and Welsh governments have worked closely together to try and defend the interests of our devolved parliaments. But we have to be honest and say that we've not had much success in doing that, despite strenuous efforts. And in the north of England, the intransigence of Westminster has also been experienced during the row over lockdown and furlough support. And Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester, has said that he was worried by the Prime Minister's comments on devolution and that we live in a very London-centric country, which is why it's a divided country. Now, all of this commentary has prompted the usual suspects to start talking about federalism again. And I want to be very clear that I have nothing against federalism. I think federalism works really well in Canada, for example, where the provinces were in the room for the negotiations over the CETA trade agreement and the provinces run their own immigration programmes. What Scotland would give to be in that position within the UK. But the problem, as I see it, is that although federalism is always discussed when support for Scottish independence is on the rise, I see little appetite for federalism across the UK. And whereas Scottish independence is a matter for the Scots, by which I mean people living in Scotland, federalising the UK is a project which requires support across the four nations. And only the Liberal Democrats have any sort of meaningful commitment to federalism as a policy, and they are far from power at present. Uh, recently, one of my predecessors as an MP for the seat in which I currently stand, uh, Malcolm Rifkind, um, reminded us that in 1975, he said that devolution should be a step towards federalism. But he, when in office as Scottish Secretary, didn't progress the case for either devolution or federalism at all. In fact, quite the reverse, he was part of a Tory administration that turned its back resolutely on the desire for devolution in Scotland in the 80s and the early 90s. And his recent discovery of the merits or rediscovery of the merits of an idea he flirted with 45 years ago, in my opinion, lacks credibility. And I have to say that I didn't think that Professor James Mitchell was being overly harsh when he said that unless Sir Malcolm converts his party and provides a slogan and a, 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 converts his party and provides a scheme rather than a slogan on federalism, his contribution should be treated with what Professor Mitchell described as contempt. Now, Malcolm Rifkind is not the only leading Scottish politician of yesteryear who uh, periodically flirts with the idea of federalism. In August 2014, at an event at the Edinburgh Book Festival, Gordon Brown said that talks on extending devolution should begin the day after the referendum, if the no side won, and that within two years, the United Kingdom would be a federal state. During that giddy summer, he also promised that Labour proposals would move the UK as close to federalism as could happen in a country where 85% of it is comprised of one nation. But of course, none of this has come to pass. And there's good reason for the cynicism on the nationalist left in Scotland, because federalism has been promised many times, but not delivered. And it won't be delivered now because there's no one in the British government who wants federalism. Their constitutional direction of travel is the other way. Furthermore, I think Ben Ray of, of Source Direct made a very important point when he wrote earlier this week that the increased desire for independence in Scotland is not just an expression of national identity, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the expression of a desire to relocate power from London and to use that power differently. Everyone wants to build back better after the pandemic, but Scotland needs to do so to our own design. Federalism wouldn't allow Scotland to develop the sort of different economic direction that the independence movement longs for. Federalism wouldn't allow Scotland to get rid of Trident, one of the central planks of SNP policy. And federalism would not allow Scotland to rejoin the European Union, 
and in relation to rejoining the European Union, there is some urgency. The regulatory divergence which the UK government seems determined to impose upon Scotland could make rejoining the EU a more onerous process. And that's why, despite the periodic talk of federalism, the focus of the debate in Scotland is about independence and a second independence referendum. The British government are pressing ahead with their constitutional priorities regardless of the pandemic and regardless of the economic fallout from the pandemic. And whilst the First Minister of Scotland and her government have rightly had their primary focus on the COVID crisis, Scotland cannot afford not to counter the constitutional agenda of the British government. Now, recently, Gordon Brown chose to echo the words of Theresa May by saying, now is not the time. The trouble is that for Scotland, British politicians telling us now not now, tends to mean not ever. And to those who parrot the words of our former and current First Ministers when they said that the last referendum was a once in a generation vote, I would say to them that that was then and this is now. Besides, what constitutes a generation in political terms? I'm a member of Generation X, born between 1965 and 1980. The next generation after that is the millennials, born between 81 and 96. These are time spans of only 15 years. With respect to devolution, 18 years passed between the 79 and 97 referendums, so that was rather longer than a generation. But we should remember that until Labour won the 1997 general election, Scotland's renewed desire for devolution had been ignored by the Conservative Party in power for more than a decade. And I think that's something that we in the nationalist movement need to bear in mind when people say that we don't need a plan B. And I'm coming to that in a moment. But just sticking with this idea that there should only be an independence a referendum once in a generation, you could argue that the political events of the past six years have been more tumultuous than we normally experience in a generation. In the years since 2014, we've lived through a number of political generations. The days of Cameron and Clegg feel like ancient history. Theresa May is now in the political wilderness, together with a host of well-respected Conservatives who now find themselves politically homeless. The Liberal Democrats, who were part of the government up until 2015, are now reduced to a rump in Parliament, with their last but one leader ousted at the general election. The Corbyn era has come and gone, and Britain has left the European Union. These events are considerably more than we normally experience in a generation. Now, on the issue of sovereignty and Irish unity, the Northern Ireland Act of 1998 provides that the Northern Ireland Secretary shall not allow a second border poll any earlier than seven years before the previous poll. Now, even allowing for the very different context in Northern Ireland, if seven years between referendums to leave the United Kingdom is acceptable for Northern Ireland, why not for Scotland? The bottom line surely must be that if the party or parties who have a clear commitment to a second independence referendum in their manifestos, if they win the Scottish election, election next year, then it would really be a Trumpian denial of democracy for there not to be a second independence referendum. However, if ever any United Kingdom leader were capable of Trumpian behaviour, then it's Boris Johnson. So I believe it makes sense for my party to think about what we should do in the event that the Prime Minister refuses to agree the means by which a second independence referendum can be held as David Cameron did with Alex Salmond in the Edinburgh Agreement of 2012. At that time, it was agreed that the power to hold a referendum would be transferred to the Scottish Parliament under Section 30 of the Scotland Act. A recent poll suggests that two thirds of voters want a fallback strategy to secure a second independence vote if a Section 30 order is refused this time round. But there are some in my party who are very reluctant to contemplate the options in such a scenario. 
They believe that to do so might detract from the pressure on the Prime Minister to do the right thing. To them I say, Boris Johnson is not renowned for doing the right thing, particularly when it comes to Scotland. I understand the argument that his refusal to grant a Section 30 order is unsustainable, but whether that argument is right remains to be seen. What worries me is if that we are waiting on goodwill and largesse from Boris Johnson, it could be a very long wait. No Conservative and Unionist Prime Minister wants to be the one on whose watch Scotland was lost. And it would be even more ignominious for Boris Johnson because he is the author of the catalyst for independence, and that is Brexit. So for now, it's a comforting thought that his position is unsustainable, but it's a hope at best. And it's my belief that that hope should not prevent my party from looking at what leverage we have in the meantime. It should also be remembered that the capitulation of David Cameron and the signing of the Edinburgh Agreement in 2012 came after protracted discussions. It was secured as a result of pressure that was irresistible, not just because of the mandate the Scottish National Party won in 2011, but also because of the robust, robust leadership and statecraft of the Salmond government. Some of the present reluctance to discuss alternative strategies comes from the absolutely correct view that the means by which independence is secured must be both democratic and legitimate in order that the outcome is internationally recognised. I agree with that and I would add that a democratic and legitimate process is also necessary to bring the British government to the negotiating table after the vote is won. But I think we may see a rather different attitude towards Scottish independence internationally from what we saw in 2014. A joint paper published earlier this week by the Scottish Centre for European Relations and the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung looked at EU views of the United Kingdom post-Brexit. And the paper identifies a general expectation that the European Union the European Union will be neutral in any future Scottish independence referendum, partly because of the state of EU-UK relations, which is not very good at the moment, but also because the United Kingdom is now a third country and the pro-EU sentiment in Scotland has been noted. They go on to say that the common view is that provided Scotland becomes independent in a legally and constitutionally valid way with agreement between London and Edinburgh, Scotland could have a normal accession process to the European Union, although there is a high alertness to Spanish se sensitivities. But of course, Scotland is not Catalonia and the United Kingdom is not Spain. There is nothing in the unwritten British constitution which prohibits Scotland from becoming independent. Indeed, on the contrary, the British constitution has already shown that it is flexible enough to permit an independence referendum for Scotland. Prior to the advent of devolution, it was thought that a simple majority of pro-independent Scottish MPs would be sufficient to open negotiations on independence. And I think that is why some in my party have suggested using a Scottish election as a plebiscite if a Section 30 order continues to be refused. And I think this suggestion raises the question of whether we should be so wedded to the idea of a referendum to deliver independence. Earlier this year, before lockdown, I attended a very entertaining lecture at the London School of Economics entitled Unions and Their Breakups, the United Kingdom's Attempted Secession from the European Union and its Possible Outcomes. It was delivered by Brendan O'Leary, the Lodger Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. And his focus was on the domestic constitutional consequences of the United Kingdom's secession from the European Union. And I should just say that he defines secession as formal withdrawal from a central authority. Now, I was very interested to hear him say that most secessionist movements that have been successful have done so without any central role for a referendum. But the reality is that in Scotland, we did have a referendum in 2014, and the result was no. 
So we need to demonstrate there ha that there has been a change of opinion. I asked Professor O'Leary what he thought the Scottish National Party should do. And he said that he thought it would be very hard for the SNP to depart from its formal commitment to the idea that a referendum will be the mechanism after we've won a majority of pro-independence MPs in the Scottish Parliament. But and I, I think he makes a very fair point. But I would wish to emphasise that we should not assume that the only way a legitimate referendum can occur is if Boris Johnson agrees to it. In 2012, before the Edinburgh Agreement was signed, seven legal academics, including three distinguished professors, published a paper challenging the view that only Westminster has the legal authority to sanction an independence referendum. And again, recently, one of the authors, Professor Aileen McCarg, and her senior colleague, uh, Chris McCorkendale, have re reaffirmed this view. And they said, and I quote, Although it's frequently asserted that a referendum on independence falls out with devolved competence, that issue has never been conclusively settled. My friend Adrian O'Neill, the leading QC who won the Article 50 revocation and prorogation cases, has produced a detailed opinion setting out the argument that Holyrood has the power to legislate to hold a referendum on the question of independence. He's advancing this argument in a case currently before the Court of Session in Edinburgh, eh, brought by a gentleman called Martin Keatings against the Advocate General for Scotland and eh, the Lord Advocate. Now, on Brexit Day earlier this year, my party leader, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, gave a speech in which she considered this issue. And she said, and I quote, the issue of whether the specific constitutional reservation in the Scotland Act puts any form of independence referendum outside the powers of the Scottish Parliament or instead leaves open scope for a non-binding consultative vote has never been tested in court. That means it cannot be said definitively that it would not be legal, but equally it cannot be described as being beyond legal doubt. If a proposal for a referendum on that basis was brought forward, it would be challenged in court. If a court ruled that it was legal, it wouldn't be a wildcat referendum, as our opponents like to brand it. It would be within the power of the Scottish Parliament. Should the UK government continue to deny Scotland's right to choose, we may reach the point where this issue does have to be tested. And she continued, I am not ruling that out, but I also have to be frank. The outcome would be uncertain. There would be no guarantees. It could move us forward, but equally it could set us back. So my judgment at this stage is that we should use our energies differently. And she went on to announce a constitutional convention and policy papers, neither of which have come to pass, sadly, because of the pandemic. But it's my view that if the pro-independence referendum parties in Scotland, and that's not just the SNP, there's also the Greens and some other smaller parties, if those pro-independence and pro-independence referendum parties obtain a majority at the Scottish election next year and the Prime Minister refuses to come to the table to negotiate a second Edinburgh Agreement, the avenue which the First Minister contemplated earlier this year should be pursued and indeed must be pursued. It would require a carefully crafted bill, to use the, friends of, the words of my friend Kevin Pringle, it would require a carefully crafted bill to be piloted through Holyrood. Then, when the inevitable legal challenge came, it would be for the courts to decide whether the bill passed was within the competence of the Scottish Parliament and thus whether the referendum so authorised could proceed. They would do so by a process of statutory interpretation and I have no doubt that the case would end up in the UK Supreme Court. If the courts found the bill to be within the competence of, of Holyrood, then we would have a lawful, legitimate referendum. And it would be one which would be very hard for unionists to boycott. But if we lost the case, then I'm afraid I respectfully disagree with the First Minister. I don't think we would be any further back than the stalemate that will ensue if Boris Johnson digs his heels in. And I would expect the UK Supreme Court and indeed Scotland's Supreme Court to look to the wider constitutional context and to have some comments to make 
about a government which doesn't allow a second independence referendum when there's a clear electoral mandate in favour of one. And when I talk about the wider constitutional context, what I mean by that is I think it's unfortunate that the debate about the legitimacy of any Scottish vote for self-determination has become so focused on whether or not the UK government will grant a Section 30 order. What this has meant is that we are discussing Scotland's right to self-determination purely through the prism of a devolved settlement which is barely 20 years old. And I believe that sends out the wrong message both at home and abroad. The legislation governing the devolved settlement should not be the last word on whether Scotland can legitimately vote to secede from a union which is over 300 years old. The nature of the United Kingdom is not always well understood internationally and indeed not always well understood in the United Kingdom. And I've found that when speaking to international audiences, if I explain that the foundation of the United Kingdom is a treaty of union between two ancient sovereign states, a penny drops, they realise then that the independence movement, the Scottish National Party, is not a movement for regional secession, but a movement for the resumption of a statehood which dates back to the Declaration of Arbroath in 1320. Now, Article 1 of the Treaty of Union between Scotland and England reads as follows, that the two kingdoms of Scotland and England shall upon the 1st of May next ensuing and for ever after be united into one kingdom by the name of Great Britain. But those words forever after are not the problem that some might think, because equally the acts of the Parliament of Great Britain and Ireland affecting the union of Great Britain and Ireland in 1800 also included a provision that Great Britain and Ireland would on the 1st of January 1801 and forever after be united into one kingdom. But notwithstanding those words and forever after, the union of Great Britain and Ireland came to an end on the 6th of December 1921 by a constitutional process. So, and I'm indebted to this argument, I'm indebted for this argument to Aidan O'Neill, who's advancing it in the Keatings case. It's clear as a matter of constitutional law that a union of the UK's constituent nations from time to time may be brought to end by a constitutional process. And that's a position that predates devolution by some years. Now, as I say, my colleague Aidan O'Neill is advancing this argument in the Keatings case. And I have to say that that case is looking theoretically at the issue of whether Holyrood has the power to hold a referendum. And I think it's a pity that the case is proceeding in the absence of the sort of carefully crafted bill from the Scottish Parliament that I would like to see. But full legal argument in the case is going to be heard in January of next year, and its outcome could yet have repercussions for the debate and the strategy that I would favour. Now, in a lecture to a centre for governance, it's only right that I should focus on process and I make no apology for doing that. But before I conclude, I want to be very clear that the SNP is not complacent about the polls which predict victory for us in next year's election or the polls which predict victory in a second independence referendum. And it's my very firm view that it is policy and planning for the transition to an independent nation and membership of the EU that will win the prize of independence. Because once the independence campaign proper begins, a searing focus will be turned upon the plans of the Scottish National Party for the economy, trade relations with the rest of the UK and the process of rejoining the EU. It's therefore time for us to expedite publication of the new Scotland policy papers, which the First Minister promised on the 31st of January. These will provide the information and answers that people want to see on how Scotland can make the transition from a yes vote to becoming an independent country. Now, I absolutely understand why work on these papers was paused by the Scottish Government to allow focus on the COVID crisis. But if, as some of my colleagues are predicting, we are to have an independence referendum soon, this work must recommence. The Conservative Party has not halted their plans to leave the customs union in the single market, 
nor their plans to undermine devolution. So likewise, the SNP cannot halt its plans for independence. A huge amount of thinking about policy matters has gone on in Scotland and indeed across the UK within academic institutions, which could be of great assistance to us. And it's also gone on within think tanks and organisations like the Scottish Centre for European Relations, like Common Wheel, like Business for Scotland and the Scottish Independence Convention, who just recently the other day published a paper on borders. All of this information and research needs to be pulled together and packaged for consumption by voters. But finally, I need to address the issue of what the repercussions of Scotland's journey back to statehood will be for the rest of the United Kingdom. I believe that Scottish independence could be the catalyst for the sort of constitutional reform in England which is talked about by the chattering classes, but for which governments seem to have no appetite. I say England because I think there's a very real question as to what the rest of the UK will consist of after Scotland resumes the status of an independent state. And on this, once more, I find myself in agreement with John Major in his Middle Temple lecture, when he predicted that Scotland will leave the UK first, and then Northern Ireland will, re will follow and reunite with the rest of Ireland. So I suppose the question is, what of Wales? But for this, I will defer to others and perhaps to next year's lecture. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Joanne, for that fascinating, fascinating lecture, um, Jochen Bauer. Um, we are uh, now in a position to um, take some questions from the audience. Uh, there's a chat function. Uh, better if you have a question to use the Q&A function that we can, uh, we can check. Um, I'd like to start uh, with a question uh, submitted by Kate Crichton, who's a constituent of yours, uh, which picks up on the question about, um, about Scotland's relationship with the EU, uh, on which you've, uh, you've touched uh, significantly in the lecture. But she asks in the context of the conversion of no voters to yes voters in Scotland, and says we'll need a binding assurance from the EU that Scotland will be welcome to join as an independent nation and asks about the steps that might be taken to get an assurance of that kind. Well, first of all, thanks, Kate, for the question. Um, it would be wonderful to get a binding assurance from the European Union, but I, I don't think that's something we can hope for. I think what, what's very clear is that Scotland will require to go through the accession process that uh, any other country requires to go through to join the EU because we're no longer part of it any longer. Uh, we left on 31st of January uh, this year. But I think um, the paper published, the joint paper pub published by um, the Scottish Centre for European Relations and the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, this week makes very comforting reading on that when it notes the fact that the EU is likely to be neutral in a future Scottish independence referendum. Uh, it doesn't take the same view as it did when, when the UK was a member state, where the UK is now a third country. And also there's a great awareness in the European Union of Scotland's pro-EU uh, stance. And of course, much of that is down to the leadership afforded by Nicola Sturgeon and also some excellent diplomacy carried out by my colleagues in the Scottish Government, including Ben McPherson, Fiona Hislop, Mike Russell, uh, and also um, the uh, hubs which have been opened up by the Scottish Government in cities uh, across uh, Europe. So I, I think we have every reason to be optimistic that while we will face the same accession process, we can go through that accession process uh, a good deal more quickly than other nations uh, have done. And there's a fair amount of academic writing on how long that might take. Kirsty Hughes from the Centre on European Relations written about this. James Kerr Lindsay uh, has written about this. Um, I'm not going to make up SNP policy on the hoof here, 
but I can assure you that when we come to the independence referendum, there'll be a very clear statement of intent in relation to that. So I regret to say I don't think the EU is in the business of giving out assurances in advance of the usual treaty process, but I think uh, the augurs are good, um, particularly linked to that paper published earlier this week. Thank you. Um, we've had a, a, another question. One of the great benefits of uh, uh, this online mode is that we can have a much wider audience than we would normally expect. We've had a question from the from the Basque country, from uh, Ander Larn, Larnby Anderson. Um, apologies for uh, stumbling over the name. Um, who mentions a, a Vienna Commission of the Council of Europe issuing just over a month ago revised guidelines for holding referendums and it says certain media in the Spanish state for example have attempted to present the document as the final nail in the coffin for unsanctioned referenda pushback against referendum results undesired by certain sectors is being used to try and block the right of stateless nations democratically to choose their own future uh, in the view of the understandable state-centric view of the Council of Europe and other supranational organisations, what could or should Scotland and other stateless nations do to change this view and ensure the right for people to express their constitutional choice, uh, choices are respected in practice? Well, I think it's very important that the, the right to self-determination is respected in practice, but I suppose I'm really focusing this evening on Scotland's position, and as I've tried to argue, there is nothing in the British Constitution to prevent Scotland from leaving this voluntary union. It's not like the Spanish Constitution, where, as I understand it, there's an express prohibition against referendums. Now, I'm not in the business of advocating a wildcat referendum for Scotland. You know, I'm a lawyer. I spent a lot of time in the last two years litigating to try and keep the British government within the rules. Um, but the main reason is I, I, I want our vote for independence to be internationally recognised. But I don't want all the power to be in the hands of the British government. So I want us to explore our options for bringing Boris Johnson to the negotiating table or indeed holding our own legal and legitimate referendum. Thanks. And um, following on from that, we've had uh, several uh, contributors, mostly from uh, various parts of Scotland, uh, asking about the Treaty of Union, the 1707 Treaty of Union, <clears throat> and wondering about whether, as an international treaty, um, Scotland could simply withdraw from that Treaty of Union, uh, mentioning on a number of occasions um, ways in which the terms of the treaty have been broken um, as, uh, as a potential reason for doing so. Yeah. I understand why people ask this question and I get a lot of email traffic about this question. But as I said in my lecture, the bottom line is Scotland had an independence referendum in 2014. And at that time, the majority of people uh, voted to uh, stay part of the United Kingdom. And we need to find a way to demonstrate democratically, not just by opinion polls, but by a referendum or possibly as some have suggested by a, a plebiscite election. But I've explained why I think a referendum would be better to demonstrate that opinion has changed. Opinion polls aren't enough. And there is no legal shortcut to referendum, to independence. The only thing that the law can do is assist Scotland in, in, in legitimately expressing that change of opinion. But the law, you know, there isn't some magic bullet to trigger Scottish independence without a democratic vote. And so, yes, it's true to say that the Treaty of Union has been breached in a number of respects. And uh, I've recently written to the Lord Chancellor about my concerns about his proposals on reform of judicial review, that, that it might uh, do so. But, um, you know, litigation is for legal outcomes, sometimes legal outcomes of political consequences. But I don't see a, a unilateral withdrawal or a legal route to independence. What I want to see is a democratic route, a way in which we can clearly and legitimately express that the balance of opinion has changed. Thanks. An another question on referendums. We've had a, a question from Anne 
uh, Fould saying she'd like to know your views on a recent proposition about holding a referendum with the election next year to establish a view on devolution in the Scottish Parliament as a precursor to an independence referendum. Right, so to establish a view on on protecting the Scottish Parliament or protecting the current devolved settlement or to look for more powers, I don't quite understand. Um, uh, it's it, it, it's not uh, entirely clear from the question, but I think it's to establish a view on um, on on potential threats to devolution yeah. in the Scottish Parliament. Yeah, I mean, I think you know we we know that in um, 1997, 75 percent there was 75 percent support for the current devolved settlement in the referendum that took place then. And we know from repeated Scottish elections that the majority of um, representatives uh, elected by voters in Scotland, both in the Scottish Parliament and in Westminster, support the current devolved settlement. You know, as I said in my speech on the 7th of October, the Scottish Parliament voted overwhelmingly, um, all parties apart from the Conservatives, to um, reject the Internal Market Bill. So I think, you know, the, the support for independent uh, for devolution in Scotland is without question. I don't think the Conservative Party could seriously question that. The problem we have for independence is we have thrown in our face that there was a referendum uh, six years ago and that the majority voted no. And, and that is correct. And so we have to find our focus has to be on finding a way to demonstrate in a democratic and legitimate fashion that will be recognised at home and abroad that that has changed. And I, really what I'm seeking to say is we need to be a little bit more imaginative about how we do that. And just to flip back to the previous question, you know, I don't say the Treaty of Union is irrelevant. The Treaty of Union is relevant in giving the context of this debate. I do think it's very unfortunate that we have got so bogged down in viewing the issue of how Scotland becomes independent purely through the prism of what powers were retained at Westminster and what powers were devolved to Scotland only 22 years ago. You know, the union's more than 300 years old. The union was a voluntary entity. I, I think it's really important in um, ensuring that we have international support and understanding to explain what the basis of this union is and, and not to let people um, assume this is just some sort of movement for regional secession in Scotland, because it, it's so much more than that. Um, I'm going to try and tempt you on to uh some welsh ground now you okay um uh so uh we've had a a, a a number of questions which i'll try and um weave together uh keith bush has asked whether the shotgun wedding of 1707 must inevitably end in a messy divorce or whether there's another option namely a more gradual separation involving all four members of the family going their increasingly separate ways while still remaining friends. But building on your point about the, um, uh, uh, about the voluntary nature of the union, uh, we've also had several questions uh, noting that uh, the relationship between England and Wales is, doesn't have the same roots in voluntary agreement or in a treaty that the uh, that the uh, Anglo-Scottish Union had, or indeed mm. that the Union of Great Britain and Ireland uh, historically uh, had. Uh, and we're, we've had a number of questions asking uh, about what that might mean for, uh, for the position of Wales in this context. So I, I, I also was at uh, Brendan O'Leary's lecture, and I remember his riffing on the potential acronyms for the different states that might exist <laughs> as bits left and uh, you know brendan being originally from uh, uh from ireland from the, from the north of ireland talked about uh, the kingdom of great britain of course that acronym is already taken uh, kgb but he also <laughs> talked about q the kingdom of england and wales well, yes, the, the, the history of England and Wales association is rather different from Scotland and England, but I don't think anyone could seriously question Wales's nationhood 
I mean, look at the language. The language has been kept alive and the culture is so rich. And also Wales has its own assembly. And I think, you know, one of the things I've noticed since I've been a, a, a member of parliament is how many of the Welsh MPs, and, and not just Plaid Cymru, I mean, primarily I tend to socialise with Plaid Cymru MPs, but how many of the Welsh MPs, including Welsh Labour MPs, and indeed even some Welsh uh, Conservative MPs, are very conscious of their Welsh nationality and very uh, well educated, not only speaking their own language, but very well educated in their country's history and, 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 and culture. So simply because the history of Wales and England's association is different from Scotland and England, that, to my mind, that in no way undermines the legitimacy of the rapidly growing movements for uh, Welsh independence. And I clearly, I, I wish it well, and I have many friends in it. Um, so I, you know, I, my lecture this evening is very much directed at solving the problem that we face at the moment of this rigidity of the British government and trying to perhaps change the nature of the debate a little so it's not so focused on how the relatively modern and young uh, event of devolution, the rules governing that should not be the last word on, on how Scotland becomes independent. Uh, arguably, there's a uh, another sense in which that um, just over 20 year history of devolution uh, and the character of the moment when uh, you know the the Scottish Parliament was created or recreated and at that stage the National Assembly for Wales was created which you know has now become a uh, a parliament a legislature with primary legislative powers um, and that's that the referendums that led to devolution were simply seen to be a matter for the for the people of the uh, of the nations that uh, uh, to which power might be devolved uh, rather than being seen mm. as a matter for the people of the state as a whole so there is a kind of implicit uh, uh, sense even back at the origins of devolution of the multinational uh, character of 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 the United Kingdom, I think. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's a really good point, and I, I think also something that I should say in response to the previous question, which I think it touched on, was I, I think it will be very important um, when Scotland becomes independent, and if Ireland reunifies, and if Wales should choose a different constitutional path. There will always require to be, there will always be a special relationship within these islands. And I think it would be interesting to create a bottom up body, not a governing body, but a body where the governments of the different nations get together to discuss common interests. And I mean, at the moment, we see ourselves in a really, really difficult position where um, the British government is intent on a a little Britain style path, you know, a, a hard Brexit and and really moving away from the continent of which it's part in political and socio-economic terms. Whereas, you know, Scotland very much aspires to move towards the European Union and be a, be a part of it. But, you know, I said in my speech rather pessimistically that I think as fear we're stuck with the Conservatives in government in London for possibly the next nine years but they're not going to be there forever and there may be England may wish to take a different direction there are I have many English friends who would like to see England rejoin the EU perhaps in a generation or at least perhaps move a bit more close to it so I think um, there will be a, a real role for some sort of council of the islands or something going forward uh, and uh, to reflect the commonality of interest, but it has to be a really different experience from what Scotland and Wales have endured in the joint ministerial committee. You know, this has to be sovereign governments meeting as equals. Uh, in, in your speech, you, you talked about the relocation of power from London and, um, and also mentioned uh, Andy Barnum and, mm. um, you know, these, um, uh, these city city mayors or metro mayors uh, in in England, um, 
Uh, Anne Bynan has asked about yesterday's announcement on the Shared Prosperity Fund and Leveling Up Fund and how it'll be managed, uh, particularly uh, the focus on um, it being allocated by the yeah. UK government and through uh, through MPs. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was a, a shocking um, way to circumvent local democracy. Uh, you know, uh, we as MPs, we have important functions, but we're not, you know, Lady Bountiful that, or Lord Bountiful that should dole out funds that they've got from their master's table to our constituents. You know, we all, you know, I'm sitting here in Edinburgh, we have a, a local authority and, you know, the devolved government's just down the road. Um, so I, I find that extraordinary and well, Trumpian almost. Um, but, but I think it's really interesting that Boris Johnson made his comments about devolution being a disaster, as I understand it, in a meeting with Red Wall MPs. So he was speaking to Tory MPs from the North, the Midlands and the North of England. And I assume he was speaking in a context where he was moaning about Andy Burnham and some of the other Northern Metro mayors and their alliance and the way in which they've really stood up for their local areas. And probably saying to these red wall MPs, well, we're certainly not giving them any more devolution because look, look how uppity they are already. Um, I think it would be really good for England to have greater local democracy and more regional devolution. But I don't see the political appetite for, for doing that. And I'm absolutely opposed to the idea that Scotland should have to wait or pause her constitutional journey to wait for England to catch up, because frankly, we'll be waiting a long time, is my opinion. And, you know, these opinion polls I've referred to 14, I think there's been another one since I wrote the lecture, 15 um, in uh, succession, showing significant majority support for independence in Scotland. You know, this is, this is a direction of travel which is very different from England's. Um, I mean, on that note, I will uh, maybe take advantage of my position uh, chairing this uh, this session to refer to some uh, some research that I've been involved with with colleagues in the Governance Centre uh, uh, and together with uh, Professor Professor Elsa Henderson at Edinburgh University, uh, where we've looked at the role of. Uh, national uh, identities and particularly relative national identities. So the relationship between um, the sub-state uh, identity, Scottishness, Welshness, Englishness in Britain and British identity in each of those places. Um, and what we found is, uh, is really a fascinating pattern uh, which suggests that British identity isn't one thing across Britain. In other words, in England, people who prioritize an English identity uh, were much more likely to vote for Brexit, whereas people who prioritize a British identity were more likely to vote Remain. In Scotland, it was the other way around, uh, and Wales followed the Scottish pattern or showed the same pattern as, as, as Scotland. Uh, and I think that, um, that amplifies this sense of um, the debates in each of the parts of Britain. And I think the same thing would be true in Northern Ireland, where, of course, Britishness means something else uh, yet again. Um, the debates are really quite distinct, um, really quite separate, you know, notwithstanding the, uh, uh, the influence of UK wide um media um so um it does then i think become quite um challenging to think about how similar sort of political economy issues similar questions about the relationship between central government and uh, and localities can translate into um into a single britain-wide political uh, uh, debate. I mean, equally, that poses challenges, I think, for the position in Scotland really being understood uh, in Westminster. And, and I'd be interested to press you on the extent to which you think um, the position in Scotland is, is, is simply misunderstood uh, by 
for example, members of the current uh, Conservative government, uh, or whether you feel they understand uh, the position fine well, but have a political agenda. Uh, one of the questions we've received in the, in, the, in the feed is a question about what you think and this is inviting you to speculate about someone else as well. But what you you mentioned the, the constitutional agenda of uh, of the Johnson administration, uh, and uh, the questioner was inviting you to uh, to say what you think in detail that agenda might be. Well, I think it, it, it's not just about Brexit, and it's not just about undermining the devolved settlement. It, it's a centralising agenda. And, the announcement yesterday, the Lady Bountiful and Lord Bountiful MPs and the Shared Prosperity Fund, that shows a very centralising agenda where all the power is held in the central government and the MPs go as supplicants rather than funding be put down through the devolved administrations and the, in England local um, authorities. But I think the constitutional agenda is much wider than that. Uh, at the moment, we have a so-called independent review into administrative law, in which the terms of reference and the language around it very clearly contemplate a restriction of the right uh, to hold executive power to account in the courts. We are promised an independent review into the Human Rights Act. Um, Conservatives like to talk about updating the Human Rights Act, but it's very important to understand that that review of the Human Rights Act is taking place against a background where one of the major sticking points in the, in the negotiations between the EU and the UK about the future relationship has been uh, the refusal of the British government to sign up to the guarantees the EU wanted in relation to the domestic protection of human rights. Now, of course, that's what the Human Rights Act is all about. It was about making people able to enforce their council, their ECHR rights through their domestic courts. And there's a very strong suspicion amongst many of us in Westminster that what the British government is seeking to do is to water down opportunities for enforcement of human rights through the domestic courts. And that's why they won't sign up to this uh, guarantee. And then in addition to, to that, of course, um, there is the uh, recent announcement that they're going to be looking at reforming the United Kingdom Supreme Court, uh, possibly um, curtailing its activities as a constitutional court to, to, use as, to use the kind of language they would use, reducing uh, the number of, of judges in the court. Um, and then, of course, in addition to that, we have what you mentioned in your introduction, is the evincing of an intention to break um, international law, to break recently entered into treaty obligations in part five of the internal market bill. So to my mind, this is this is part of a constitutional um, direction of travel, which is about centralising power in London, in Westminster, and about undermining the opportunities to hold executive power to account in the courts. And, and really, actually, I would go so far as to say as an attack an attack on the rule of law. And the language that's been used by the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary about activists and lefty lawyers. We recently had the Lord Chancellor giving evidence to the Joint Committee on Human Rights, of which I'm a member. And you know, in fairness to the Lord Chancellor, he's usually quite good on judicial impartiality defence judges, but he did not resile from this sort of language. He kind of doubled down on the criticisms that Priti Patel and the Prime Minister have made of of lefty lawyers and you know this is really very serious and uh, you know to it was lord dyson who said it's normally the sort of language you hear in a totalitarian regime the sort of language that our prime minister and home secretary have used about lawyers who are simply doing their job um so i find it a very worrying constitutional direction of travel I, yeah i'm not saying scotland is perfect and um, we have um our own issues from time to time and Scottish government from time to time has had its wrists slapped in the court over certain issues in relation to executive power and human rights aspects of, of um, Holyrood legislation. Not that often uh, to, to be fair, but I think there's a very different direction of travel up here. You know, the First Minister has an advisory group in human rights. They've produced a very exciting framework for the development of the protection of human rights in Scotland. You know, the legal profession to use uh, 
to use pretty uh, to use John, uh, Boris Johnson's words about Pretty Patel, it's the legal profession has perform, has uh, formed a protective shield around Scotland's legal system. You know, when people messing around with judicial review in Scotland. Um, so I think the direction of travel there in broader terms, just moving away from the debate about independence or union and looking at how we create a state, how we hold executive power to account, how we protect individuals' human rights. Scotland, I feel, is very much on the right side of that debate from the point of view of somebody who believes in a rules-based rule of law society. And I think Westminster is on the wrong side of it. Of course, in... Uh... Uh, Wales is part of a single legal jurisdiction with England, which relates back to some of the earlier uh, discussions about the about the differences, which, uh, and and which also um, generates some uh, uh, challenging issues around the around justice policy mm -hmm. and the balance between reserved and devolved powers in Wales uh, for for justice policy. In, in that context, I, I think it's also interesting to see the role of um, you know, former justices of the Supreme Court, uh, Lord Hope, Lord Thomas, in the House of Lords, uh, in, the, um, in, in the changes the House of Lords made yes. to, the, to the Internal Market Bill. Um, still, Lord I think- Hope has that, played a very important role in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very and Lord interesting Thomas. And, and subtle uh, uh, speech he made uh, um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, at, at, at the same time, the, the uh, Johnson administration's agenda seems to me uh, to contain some important tensions in, in these sorts of areas. So if you think about the internal market bill and how it might operate if, uh, if it was implemented uh, or, or enacted uh, along the lines um, suggested before the Lord's reforms, um, potentially it creates more demand for legal resolution of conflicts over mutual recognition, uh, uh, non-discrimination. Uh, some of the um, background material suggests that businesses might take judicial reviews of um uh, of of laws that they felt contravened uh, mutual recognition for example um so it's the the creation of a structure that seems to call out for some kind of um court based resolution system at the same time as uh, in another part of um uh, the landscape those institutions are 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 being uh, scrutinized and uh, perhaps prepared for reform um, and one can understand that you know even very senior judges might feel particularly politically exposed in this kind of a, kind of a context which brings me back to a question that Ian Thomas asked uh, 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 particularly about your um, alternative routes to a possible referendum on independence in Scotland. Uh, Ian asked, how much confidence do you have that a favourable result in the UK Supreme Court uh, will be possible, uh, particularly a UK Supreme Court whose powers will in all probability have been diminished uh, by what he calls a vengeful English Tory party? <clears throat> well, interesting question. Um, I think it may Take some. I think. I think we are some way away from the Supreme Court's powers being diminished. Although we do have a vengeful administration, I've no doubt of that. Um, but I, I think there will be. I think they will have um, some internal opposition as well as uh, opposition from the profession and, and NGOs, etc. Um, I think Pro Professor Aileen McCarg has said that uh, the Supreme Court hasn't showed a lot of interest in defending the devolved settlement. <laughs> and uh, I think not just Aileen McCarg, but also Aidan O'Neill and others have been very critical of the Supreme Court's judgment in the first Miller case on Sewell. And uh, I certainly feel it could be argued, as I think Aidan O'Neill has argued, that it um, 
their position on Sewell in the first Miller case doesn't sit very well with their attitude towards the importance of constitutional conventions in the prorogation case. Uh, maybe the Supreme Court needs to look at the Sewell Convention again. I, I know my colleagues in the Scottish Government have not ruled out the possibility of litigating uh, about the internal market bill. We'll need to see what it looks like when um, it's been back to the Commons and back to the Lords and then back to the Commons. Um, I, how confident am I of, of uh, victory in the courts on the issue of whether Scotland could hold Scottish Parliament could hold a referendum. I think there's a good argument with reasonable prospects of success. Um, but, you know, I, as a lawyer, I'm not going to say more than that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't expect uh, that you would. Um, we've had we've had a question from Paul Given about uh, Scottish independence and the currency. So whether the case, the argument is stronger if uh, Scotland is proposing its own currency and whether the SNP's policy is still for sterlingisation? Well, the SNP conference a year and a half ago uh, voted to keep sterling initially, but to move, uh, I'm trying to have exact words, as, as soon as possible to our own uh, currency. Um, I'm not going to make SNP policy up on the hoof here, um, but, you know, the policy will be clearly stated when the independence campaign uh, starts. Thanks. Um, one other question about uh, about the, the, the European context uh, and possible steps. Stuart MacDonald has asked whether EFTA is not the obvious first step, perhaps, uh, after a further referendum on that subject. A further referendum on whether we should join the European Union. I, I, I mean, I suppose it's a it's a post independence referendum question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there has been much discussion about whether Scotland should join the European Union or be in EFTA and the EEA. I mean, EFTA on its own would not be much use to us. We'd need to be in a sort of a Norway type position where you're in EFTA and the European Economic Area. Uh, the policy of the SNP very firmly is that we should be in the European Union and be sitting at the top table alongside countries like uh, Ireland and um, voting on policy and having an influence on the direction of the European Union. The problem with being in EFTA and then joining the EEA to be part of the single market is you don't have a seat at the top table. So I sometimes think that um, people think that this is, is, is a solution um, somehow it will be easier to be in EFTA and the EEA, but if you want to be in the EEA, um, you still have to have the consent of all the member states that are already in the single market. So I don't really see that it, it would really be of any benefit to us. I would like to see us in the single market and the customs union as full members of the European Union sitting at the top table. It's possible, of course, that while, while we're going through the accession process, we could be in some kind of halfway house, but I wouldn't see EFTA as a halfway house. The halfway house would be the sort of association agreement that people like Kirsty Hughes have proposed as perhaps covering us, uh, taking us through the interim period, the transition, if you like, from being where we are now and being a full member of the European Union. That's happened for other accession states. Thanks very much. Uh, um, that's a, a very clear and, uh, and and precise answer. The the uh, the EFTA position is um, is is clearly uh, very limited in terms of the uh, involvement in the shaping of policy mm -hmm. and doesn't automatically bring the uh, the free movement um, aspects. Uh, back uh, 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 completely. I, I, I suppose I'd like to press you on how how important that question of of uh, regaining free movement hugely uh, important in Scotland, hugely important because of our demographics. Um, you know, inward inward immigration, people coming from Europe and indeed the wider world to live and work and have their lives in Scotland is hugely important to the Scottish economy. 
So it's kind of a bit of a deal breaker. Free movement is really, really important for us. And this has been one of the huge frustrations of trying to uh, persuade the British government to have any kind of concession made towards um, allowing Scotland to have the kind of arrangement that I spoke about briefly in the speech that the Canadian provinces have of at least being able to run our own uh, immigration programmes. have been a very small minor concession made in that respect. But despite the promises of people like Gove uh, about Scotland being able to run its own immigration policy if we left uh, the European Union, they simply haven't come uh, about and there's absolutely no appetite at Westminster to devolve immigration to Scotland, despite huge support from that, from the business sector in Scotland, from the university sector and so on. So yeah, free movement is very important uh, for Scotland's economy. Uh, I've uh, again done some, um, uh, some deliberative workshops online over the summer um, ac across Britain on what, uh, what people want um, after leaving the EU, uh, particularly focusing on folk who voted to leave. Um, and the session in Scotland was highly distinctive because in the rest of, uh, uh, of Britain, in including to an extent in Wales, uh, leavers remained very concerned about, uh, about migration as a potentially uh, threatening Thing, although there was quite a lot of evidence of people um, also recognizing, especially in the pandemic context, the contribution that uh, uh, European migrants working in care, uh, working in uh, uh, the health service had made. Um, but in Scotland, even amongst leavers, uh, migration, you know, the idea of immigrants, um, really wasn't uh, seen as a, as a negative issue, as a concern uh, at all. The discussion was much, much more focused on the economy. Um, and on that slightly self-indulgent note, <laughs> uh, I, I think it was very important to pick up that question of the, uh, of the place of free movement uh, for Scotland. Uh, looking ahead. But on that uh, rather self-indulgent note, I'd like to thank you for a fascinating, fascinating talk, uh, for being so generous in, uh, in your answering a, a wide range of questions. You know, they're on, on, on these sorts of uh, online uh, uh, events. There are always many, many more questions than we can get to. And I apologize to those in the audience who've asked questions that we haven't managed to get to, but I'd like to thank um, uh, thank you, Joanna, very much indeed for your uh, for your fascinating lecture today, and also to thank the audience uh, and those behind the scenes who've made this possible. I've enjoyed myself uh, tremendously and uh, learned a lot, and it's been a real pleasure to see you again, uh, even if only through a screen. Uh, well, Thank you. I mean, it's been it's been my pleasure and my privilege, and great to see you too. Noswith Dabab.